Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, number 277, Hark the Herald. gather together this morning, O Heavenly Father, to sing Your praise, to worship You who reign above, who guides and directs all of our lives, even for our benefit, sent Your Son down to this earth, that He might be born in a small town, obscure from the rest of the world, and laid in a manger, only for the purpose to give His life that he might die in our place to give us a second birth. Dear Lord Jesus, we praise you for being faithful to your Father's will and even sending the Holy Spirit to come and live in our hearts that we would rejoice not only in the little baby being born 2,000 plus years ago, but he might be born for our salvation. Help us not to forget the whole purpose of Him coming, of you coming. We ask even now that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to rejoice in your in celebration of your birth. And thank you for teaching us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, while we're seated, we'll sing the next two hymns, number 273 and 255. Thank you. 
The insert is for our closing hymn, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, just in case. If you would please open up your Bibles along with me for, uh, to Luke chapter 2. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just up to verse, I believe it's 19, actually 20. Luke chapter 2 through verse 20. Hear the reading of God's holy word, and may it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. <clears throat> In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom His favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you sent your Son into this world to save sinners. Father, we pray even now that you would help us to see the, the work of Christ was not in isolation and not for that time but for all time, past, present, and future, until he turns, returns again, that we would see that he accomplished this work for us, that until he comes again, we would be faithful in fulfilling his purposes designed for all of us. Bless the ministry of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When we consider the outlook of our current events, I guess you could say that our current events in the past week, in the past month, have been getting worse you could say that it might be causing a, a little bit of fear in all of us for the future with that being said what do we have to rejoice about this Christmas you know we're not the only generation we can't look at this generation this time of our families and our lives in isolation of the past. That's what postmoderns do. They think that all that surrounds them that is in time means nothing except for their lives. But we need to remember that there were many generations that considered their lives, their times, to be the last time. That Christ was coming imminently. That means immediately. They expected him to come soon. Even all the way back to Paul. And for 2,000 plus years now, generations after generations have thought circumstances were so bad for them that surely they were in the last days and that Christ was going to return immediately. I don't have to remind us of what life was like in the South right after the Civil War, but that's probably as close as it's going to get to us with our grandparents or our great-grandparents, great-grandparents having been a part of that, the time during the Reconstruction, the time of the carpetbaggers when the North was invading the South, essentially, and God was using those circumstances, but it was a hard time. The South had been... Overcome, we had been joined together with the Union. 
People did not have any income. Life was hard. Since then, you can think of the generations during or before World War II. As Nazi Germany was growing and expanding, and it essentially defeated the British apart from America's help. She had been pushed out of Europe all the way to her own shores, and it looked like the end that Nazi Germany was going to take over the world. Apart from a grand plan to land on European shores and overcome and to win the war. You know, after World War II was over with, America was rejoicing. But it wasn't soon after World War II that Russia began to take over all these countries in Europe and surrounding it. And those people thought that the end had come. And then America had to rise up to defend these nations who couldn't defend themselves. For them, it looked like the end. They were being engrafted and taken over, kind of like we've seen uh, uh, Putin do with the Ukraine recently. It looked like the end for them. I bet you they thought that they could count the days. But as it was, America came to the rescue in many respects to help those people defend themselves. And it was during that period that America became great because we were coming to the aid to help people be free. Not only did we help win the Great War, but we helped maintain freedom for small countries whose future looked bleak. Now, it is Americans... We've retracted our power because of the mindset that we need to be no greater than the worst or the weakest. Who are we to be superior, to be arrogant and prideful, to be so great to help somebody else out? Now, America is looking to the future and wondering, especially as you look at technology and see how Evil has just spread so quickly through the internet, even to the point of ISIS cells growing right here in America. They don't have, you don't have to cross the seas. It happens electronically. It happens in the iCloud. It happens in the space. Evil is growing. And if you're not watching the news, well, if you are watching the news and you're not on the internet, I'm sure you still have a sense of growing evil. And the times appear to be as bad as they could be. Surely these are the last days and Christ is going to return. Isn't he? We have everything to rejoice in. Even though the times might be dark. For even in those days, in the darkness shone a great light. Today, we still have the peace of God which reigns in our hearts. You who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners, aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. We have to remember that this earth is not our home. And when we remember that God is sovereign in directing all events, as dim as they might be, peace reigns in our hearts. And surely we can rejoice because we know that He has claimed the victory when Christ rose again from the grave and then again on that judgment day when our sins are washed away when we see that our sins are washed away by His accomplishment for us. Today we're going to see how even the circumstances back then, as bleak as they might have been, God had a purpose for us. First of all, 
we see in our text, in the beginning, God's providence. Taking a little different twist on our text for today, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought how amazing it is that God foreordained, that is, He predestined, these are big words, if you would look in our bulletin, in the Catechism. These are the same words that mean election. Look what it says. Are the elect only effectually called? All the elect, and they only, are effectually called. Although may, others may be, and are often are, outwardly called by the ministry of the Word, and have some common operations of the Spirit, who for their willful neglect and contempt of the grace offered to them, being justly left in their unbelief, do never truly come to Jesus Christ. So you have those who are elect and those who appear to be elect but are not. And then those who evidently are not. That's the same idea that we have here of foreordination and predestination. God foreordained, this is what's so amazing and you might not have ever thought about in His providence, God planned the birth of Christ. That the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, first of all. In Micah, it was said hundreds of years before, Michael, Micah 5, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one whose ruler will, will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherds, shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. It was this proclamation that led the Magi over the Fertile Crescent. I guess if you were to think of the Mediterranean being over here where Jerusalem is, and Babylon, where Daniel was held in captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, the people came across the Fertile Crescent to Jerusalem. The three Magi and their whole armies of people came looking for the Christ child because of this text. They knew that once the Roman Empire was established, within that empire, that hundred-year parenthesis, so to speak, the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. So they came to see this child, to find him, who was to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. God orchestrated that the child would be born in obscurity, a small town like Cherryville, out in the middle of nowhere in comparison to a great city like New York or Atlanta. Some, When you think of all the people in Times Square, and you think of all the people cram-packed into all these large cities. When you come out into the country, you were talking about a little town. My, my son had to go to a wrestling match yesterday, and my wife drove him to Moxville. It's a small little town, similar to this. It's on a two-lane road out in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. Between 85 and I-40, in a crossroads. Not much going on. That's where Jesus was born. God planned it that way. That the Messiah's mother and legal father who were not yet married. You think, you picture. He had to go home. Joseph had to take his bride, who he was not married to yet, home. And she was pregnant. The gossip that went along with that. The question marks over their marriage, yet she was yet to be given birth, pregnant. They had to go and enroll in a census. God planned for Caesar Augustus to, to issue a decree that the whole Roman Empire would enroll in a census. And how long would that census enrolling take? We can do it digitally now, or we will be, I guess. Do it digitally already? I know that it happens when you sign up for your uh, driver's license, and you have, they, they mail something to you uh, based upon that and your information, and you have to send it back in. I'm sure it's being processed, but soon enough you'll be able to do it all online, instantly. 
It'll happen within days. Then it probably took a long period of time, but God orchestrated and used the events surrounding this to bring them from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And then when you think and consider surrounding Christ's birth, God orchestrated that there would be no place for them in the end. And in fact, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the King of glory who humbled himself and took on flesh as a man would be born in a stable. And laid in a manger. I'm sure you've heard sermons about the environment in which a barn might smell, might be like. I'm sure they tried to keep it as tidy and as presentable as possible for a child to be born, as clean as possible. Yet those are the circumstances. The Christ child would be born, not in a civilized manner, so to speak, as we understand it, but in an uncivilized, dirty environment. When you consider this, and the lives that we're living and the circumstances that we're in today, in the midst of four plus billion people in the world, that's not quite our debt. I don't know how many billions it takes to be a trillions, 26 trillion or whatever is our debt today, but it's a lot. 26 billion? I don't know how many. There's a lot of people in the world today. But when you consider how huge the world is, and then you consider all the circumstances in all the world going on at that time, and then you start to come in. It almost seems insignificant apart from the Word of God. Does your life matter? When you consider our individual lives in, in, in relationship to all the events, we seem so insignificant out here deeds every day, our jobs, taking care of our families. Who are we? And the whole plan and scheme of existence from the very beginning to the end, which we know not when that will be. How insignificant we are. Yet God has a plan for our life. He's directing all events from the very beginning. Do you think then, because you experience adversity, that God does not care? Did God care about the little baby who was born in a barn and placed in a manger because there was no room? God had orchestrated it. He had planned it. God's not looking. He's not interested necessarily in our prosperity while the prosperity message and gospel preachers would promote that, that you have little faith because you're not rich and well-to-do. God's not interested in our physical well-being. He's interested in our holiness. He's interested in the outcome of our lives. What we're doing with our lives. He was interested in the purpose of Christ's coming. Not the circumstances surrounding his kingliness, he came riding in on a donkey versus a white horse. He did not have a place to lay his head. But with that end, Christ's faithfulness, our holiness, he rules the whole world. Proverbs 21.1, you've heard me say it before, but I'm saying, I'll say it to you again because it's something to consider Whenever we think that everything is going is chaos and crazy in our lives. And what could be the good of this? We need to be reminded, Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. God is the creator of heavens and earth and all therein. All the kings and the presidents and his relationships with Putin and Assad, and Syria, and all these eastern dictators, whatever his purposes are down in Cuba, 
the chancellors over the world, they are all under the sovereign decrees, God's direction and will. Nothing happens apart from His will. Amen? Even His children, God is directing our lives that we might be made into His image. Nothing slips His sight. In fact, everything was foreordained. God planned it long time ago in accordance to His will for His glory. Now, considering His providence, let us go to God's plan. When we consider God's plan and how His providence is working out in our everyday lives, God directed the, uh, the empire-wide census to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. He knew that there was going to be no room for them in the end. Couldn't he have done something different? Yes, he could. He could have turned stones into bread, couldn't he? He could have had Jesus turn stones into bread. He could have called 10,000 10, angels to rescue Christ and come to his aid in Gethsemane. He could have had Jesus come down from the cross and save himself. But the question is not, could he do it? It's what he willed to do. What was his purpose? God was not interested in Jesus living a prosperous life. God's purpose was in saving us. God's will was that Christ be born on humble places. It was His will that there was a no vacancy sign over the motels in Bethlehem. It was God's will that Christ would live a life directed for Calvary. That His end would be the cross in Jerusalem. Yes, God planned from the very beginning that there would be no room for Him at the end. That there would be no detour off the road of Calvary. But that Christ would be faithful even to die on a cross for us. And that's where, third of all, not only does His providence direct His plan, but His plan brings us peace. God's peace comes only at a great expense. We can't, I mean, we could, we could look at the baby Jesus and think, aw, you see the little baby in the manger, you have the, the magi surrounding him, you have the shepherds and the sheep and everyone bearing gifts, and you go, aw, a baby. Everybody, ladies especially, y'all, y'all love babies. Not all the men might love to hold babies, you know. But ladies, when you see babies, you love to hold the babies. Everybody loves the baby. The idea, but you can't just look at the baby scenario of Christ in isolation of the reality of what his plan was, what God's plan was for his son. That sounds a somber note when we think of how peace comes to us. Look at our text. Here in verse 14, glory to God. This is what the angels were saying. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to men on whom His favor rests. They're singing glory to God and peace on earth to whom. That is the key. It was a select, elect people predestined to be saved. The peace on earth was not for all mankind. The peace was not serenity now for all people. When you think of the baby Jesus as a little baby in isolation of his purpose, you might get warm fuzzies, but the realization that he came to die for us brings a somber note to the Christmas songs. The rose air blooming was to be crushed for us. 
The praise is for a Savior. God becoming a human being. Praise for His pre-planned life. His faithfulness and obedience. Praise for His pre-planned death. His obedience to even suffering and dying on the cross for each one of us. Praise then for His victorious resurrection and His ascension to heaven. But the peace is only limited to those for whom His favor rests. Who are those whom His favor rests? It's those people who believe the message of Christmas is for them. Peace is limited to those who recognize Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. So peace doesn't come to all people. You know, even nowadays, I don't know if you, once again, I, I've told you that I work in front of the computer. A lot of my business is on the computer. We're watching the news throughout the day. Just this week, there was word uh, by Todd Starnes. He's on the news, and you'll see excerpts of the most recent attack upon Christendom in America. And a Christmas play. Actually, uh, yeah, it was a Christmas play. A reenactment of the Peanuts Christmas. Charlie Brown Christmas. You know, everyone's searching for the meaning of Christmas till the very end at the crescendo when Linus stands up on the stage and he reads the text of Luke 2. That gives the real reason. A, a Savior, Christ the Lord, is born. That's the answer. That's what Christmas is all about. Everything comes to this point in the Charlie Brown Christmas by Linus. It was censored. They were told that the reading could not be played, could not be given, because it pointed to Christ. Can you believe that? They were told eventually by the Liberty Institute that in America, yes, our rights as Christians are preserved. And yes, we can proclaim that's what Christmas is all about. But the church, was, the school was so afraid that they censored them and said they could not do it. So you know what happened? All the parents in the audience, in unison, because they knew that this was going to happen beforehand, in unison, stood up and read the text themselves. Because the children couldn't proclaim it from stage. Isn't that wonderful? You see, the world thinks peace is serenity now, which is our irony, because there is no peace in their hearts. They think peace comes from the outside, from possessing of things, from trying to create a moment, a special moment. But see, that doesn't resolve the problem of sin in mankind comes only at a cost. That cost was read there in the very beginning in, our, in the text from Ephesians. I'll read it to you again here. Carol, that you wrote, uh, that you read there in the Advent. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace. See, God is a God of wrath and He's angry. He's a God of love, but yet He's going to punish sin. He demands punishment because He's a just God. But Christ, He is Himself is our peace. He has made the two one and destroyed the barrier dividing the wall of hostility by abolishing in His flesh the law and its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself a new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through Him we have both access to the Father by one Spirit. You see, the world does not have peace. But now we have peace and God's favor because we look to Christ and trust in Him. We might not be able to mention the words Merry Christmas in a school system. We have to be politically correct on the media does. They feel like it. 
we have to say happy holidays or something like that. Did you know that even, uh, I read this morning, or actually it was yesterday, day before yesterday, that at a Christmas holiday concert in Minnesota, in Blaine, Minnesota, that instead of praising Christ and singing Christmas hymns, they said, they praised Allah, saying Allah Akbar in Minnesota. It's politically incorrect to say Merry Christmas, but it's okay to sing in concert Allah Akbar. When you consider these last days, not only in your life, but seemingly in our country and in the future, we have hope that God reigns. That God has a wonderful plan for our lives. And that we should walk in his footsteps. Jesus said, he who would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross. He said, a sermon is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And then he calls out enthusiastically, or the disciple said, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And if you walk in his footsteps, it won't be easy. But yet he calls us to rejoice. And then, in the end, in verse 17, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told and about this child. So God tells us and gives us the Great Commission as well to proclaim the good news of Christ's birth so that those who are walking in darkness might see a great life and have hope and peace just as we do, even though they don't understand it. Let us pray. Truly, Heavenly Father, all glory and praise goes to you who are in the, who are in the highest who reign upon all creation from your throne with Jesus at your right hand. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have granted us peace, a peace that transcends all understanding, a costly peace that was purchased by the price and the death of your Son, who was born in humble circumstances, and only in those last days gained glory in the miraculous works that he did to reveal that he was God on earth. And even then, suffered, was cast out, was questioned, ultimately to the point of offering himself up and dying on a cross faithfully to your will for our good. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for being a light to the nations. And we who were not a part of the branch have now been grasped in through faith. We've been made children through the precious gift of election, through our reception of Jesus Christ into our hearts, for being born again of the Spirit Thank you, Heavenly Father and Lord Jesus, for changing us and shedding abroad your light and your love in our hearts. Thank you for giving us wisdom through your word that we can see in the world and in this story, this true-to-life, historic chronicle of the birth of our Savior, hope that we can see your plan, and we can apply it to our lives, that you have a plan for us as well. And all is well. Peace earth on whom your favor rests. Because your peace abides in our hearts. Not because of the circumstances, because we're wealthy, because of everything that's going well for us, but because you love us. And you design for us to have your peace. 
Oh, thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray, Father, that when it's hard to grasp that peace, when it feels like oil slipping through our fingers and we're filled with anxiety and the cares of this world, that, Lord, you would draw us nigh unto you. That, Father, you would cast your blanket over us. That you would hold us close in your arms, even to the point of carrying us in these difficult times, that we would know your love and not give up hope. That you would keep us and cause us to persevere. That you would remind us in your words and in these celebrations and even at Christmas, at some poignant moment, you would touch our hearts and shed abroad your love in our hearts. I pray, Father, for our loved ones who are having to suffer who've been through cancer, who have surgery next week, who've had problems with their hips, their legs, their lungs, who might have Alzheimer's, who might be losing their minds, who might be discomforted, <clears throat> who might be at home alone, who might be forgotten, who might be suffering for Christ's name in a foreign world, who might have already suffered and given themselves and for the protection of others even right here in America. Be with them, O oh Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Remind them this Christmas and this holiday season of your special love, that even though they suffer, they're in good company, that, Father, you design our lives that good might come in the end. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for our little ones, our children, <clears throat> our loved ones who are not with us, who might not even know you. I pray, Father, that you would work in our children's lives, bringing about not only salvation, but fruit that bears at the confession of faith. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, for those who are not with us today, that we wish they were here, that they would hear the gospel of your love and your faithfulness, that, Lord, you would use some other way, maybe a movie that they would watch, maybe something on the news, Something of a word spoken by another Christian to point their minds and their hearts to Christ. That he is the reason for the celebration and praise this season. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, finally for our country, that while the future might look bleak, Lord, you can do great things, not only in the upcoming election next year, but you can do a lot through the church and proclaiming the gospel to our nation that amidst the circumstances, we would have hope in you. Turn our hearts and our minds in these circumstances to you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you so much for your love to us and pray that you would bless even our time after our service of worship, to be a time of spiritual fellowship, putting down our differences and our grievances, our concerns and our fears, and binding us together in love, in fellowship and food and in gifts, as we celebrate the greatest gift for us, your Son and our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us pray, uh, I mean, sing our hymn of response, number 251 in our hymnal, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. 251. Thank you. 
be seated. At this time, let us give his tithes and our offerings. Let us stand. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. 
Just as in the imagery in Revelation that a stream flowed out of the temple, we, Lord, we recognize that your blessings flow from you, for you are the head of those streams of blessing. Father, we thank you for your many blessings to us, not only as Americans, but as your children. We have so much in consideration of all that is going on in the world and those people who are suffering. We thank you and we praise you for our many blessings. Use these funds, Father, not only to sustain this church and its ministry of the word, but our outreach as well as we participate in the Great Commission till Christ comes again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing our insert, God rest ye merry gentlemen.
amidst the world of confusion and the wreaking of havoc by Satan's power and might, we've been given tidings of comfort and joy through the gospel of salvation as proclaimed by Luke to Theophilus. We're recipients 2,000 plus years later of the greatest gift of all. And as a result of that, it doesn't wane after we open it, but it grows every year, each day, every moment as we look to Him and we trust Him. May we be motivated in the coming year to share the good news with those who are walking in darkness just as we have received it, that they too might receive Christ and receive the peace for whom His faith is. May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us this eternal encouragement and good hope encourage our hearts and strengthen us in every good and word and deed in this coming year and until He comes again. In Jesus' name, Amen.